When this camera maker released this model in 1989, it had no idea that within two years, it essentially would be out of business and the country in which it operated would no longer exist. What camera is this? Let's jump into the video and find out. Here we have the Practica BMS, a camera notable because it was near the end of the line for this camera maker and also near the end of the line for the country, which was East Germany. Within probably a year or so of its release, East Germany ceased to exist and uh, not long after reunified with West Germany to become just Germany. The Practica BMS arrived at a time when much of the industry was beginning to uh, transition to autofocus cameras. and. The Canon Rebel, of course, had led the pack with its uh, marketing campaign using uh, tennis player Andre Agassi, very popular campaign, and went on to sell millions of cameras and convinced the rest of the industry that may, perhaps it was time to move to more automated cameras with um, autofocus, uh, auto wind, um, and auto exposure. You know, really fully, uh, fully battery dependent, but fully automated cameras that provided you with, you know, very good images with very little effort. I guess that's the best way to put it. So the Practica BMS, in, in contrast, um, offered none of that. <laughs> there was no provision for a motor drive. Um, it was manual exposure, manually set exposure, uh, manual focus, manual setting of your aperture and your shutter speeds. Everything was manual. Manual film advance, manual rewind. Um, however, it would appeal to those photographers who really, um, really treasured or really uh, enjoyed, um, you know, the entire process of taking fo taking photographs from setting exposure themselves to manually focusing and um, just doing the, you know, advancing the film, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's take a closer look at this camera. As it states, it's electronic, and uh, well, that's partially true. That's mostly true, I guess. This uses a small six volt battery. Here's the battery chamber down here. Uh, you know, before we get into that, let's take a quick look around the camera. Here's the shutter speed dial, and your speeds run from one one thousandth of a second all the way down to four seconds plus B. The shutter on this is electronically controlled, which means no battery, um, no photography. Well, you do have one shutter speed and that is one sixtieth of a second. Here's battery check button. As far as I can tell, this doesn't work on this particular camera. There is a small collar here with an extended tab on it. This is a shutter, um, shutter release lock. It also prevents you from accidentally um, uh, turning on the meter. How you turn on the meter is you partially depress the uh, shutter release. So the uh, thinking was, and this is uh, holds true for many cameras from probably the 1970s onward, uh, particularly those cameras that were really dependent on battery power. Uh, the thinking was that if you put the camera in the bag and you know it happened to, and then you put something else in, let's say your wallet, a roll of film, a flash unit, whatever, and it happened to rest on the shutter release, it would deplete the battery. So by locking the uh, shutter release, prevented you from accidentally uh, turning on the meter. This is uh, your film speed dial. Uh, you'll notice that this is marked in ISO. Previously to this, prior to this, uh, there were two there were two um, film speed scales. One was ASA, and that was generally uh, American, and the other one was uh, DIN. D I N. I don't know what that stood for. I guess I should look it up at some point. And uh, so DIN was European. And that went back probably way, way back into the 1930s. I think there were some other um, film speed scales, but they eventually uh, decided on uh, ASA and DIN and then eventually just ISO. And in fact, ISO is used today uh, by uh, digital cameras and ISO widely uses pretty much the same speeds, I would say. And that's probably done for reasons of uh, familiarity. This camera has a 50 millimeter lens. You'll notice that it's f2.4, so it's not a super speedy lens. However, it is very compact, a very compact 50 millimeter lens. How compact? Let's take a real quick look. For uh, comparison purposes, I'm going to use a um, 
planer, a Zeiss planer. Well, it's actually a Rolly planer made under license by. It's really a Carl Zeiss planer made under license by Rolly, and you'll see how much shorter it is. Obviously, uh, this is a slower lens at f2.4, and this is f1.8. Uh, but even so, you can see how compact this lens is. This Practica used a proprietary bayonet lens mount. At first, I thought it was, uh, you know, a, a K mount, a modified K mount, but in fact, it's not. So I tried at some point, like now, <laughs> I tried to fit a, um, a K mount lens onto it, and it almost fit, but but it doesn't. And so if you look at the back of the two lenses, you'll notice that uh, this is three lobe, as is this one. But it's just different enough that it won't fit. And also there are three electronic contact points. I would guess that this, uh, that this transmits the aperture information to the camera so, it can, so that you can then meter a scene correctly. It seems to make me think that perhaps this is a Tessar type lens. Um, obviously, it's a coated lens because you can see the blue, purplish reflections and red reflections. Opening up the back, no surprises back here. You have your pressure plate. Of course, the purpose of the pressure plate is to hold the film flat against the uh, film plane, so presumably you can get as sharp as photo as possible. Uh, your take up, uh, your fresh roll film goes in here, feeds left to right. This is your sprocket wheel, fairly standard. Uh, here's your take-up spool, and your take-up spool has this uh, small serrated wheel to help you get things started by hand if you want. A little spring here to just keep the um, f keep your film in place. This uses a vertically traveling uh, metal bladed shutter. Um, what's a little bit different about this shutter is that often with most uh, shutters, when you tension the shutter, it raises it, or it brings it left to right. With this one, it never moves. So, in fact, you're charging uh, the spring, I would imagine, this, the uh, spring mechanism inside. And then when it's released, it actually moves up and down very quickly. Where generally, with most cameras, you bring that shutter to the top, or you bring it to one side and then it travels across the film plane in one motion. So this uses both an up and down motion, which, and you wouldn't think that you would be able to get the highest speed using that. The one thing I do believe is because of the um, up and down motion of the shutter is that there's a lot more vibration than I would expect from a camera. Uh, because all the speeds are electronically controlled when you get to the slow speeds, for example, there's no whirring of the um, slow speed escapement, which is a timing mechanism. See? So by comparison, if you were to take a, a camera with an all-manual shutter and you shoot one of the lower speeds, you can hear that escapement. There's a lot of plastic in the construction of this camera. Plastic. Uh, I believe the top deck is plastic. Uh, film advance is plastic. Rewind crank, plastic. Uh, plastic, plastic. The frame itself is metal. And those that generally was true throughout the uh, entire industry. Back is metal. Interior appears to be metal. But most of your exterior uh, parts, aside from the back and probably the, uh, the front shell of the camera, those are plastic. However, it doesn't affect the integrity of the camera. It just really affects the uh, the weight. The overall feel of the camera is good. Doesn't feel cheap. Doesn't have, body doesn't have any flex to it. And uh, you know, like I said, it's I think it's a fairly nice little camera to uh, carry around. On the back, pretty standard. Your, as I mentioned, your battery chamber. Here's your rewind button to rewind the film. This is simply a push and release. And here's your tripod socket, and, and it is alignment in alignment with the center of the lens. You'll notice on the bottom it says Made in German Democratic Republic, which is East Germany, and it was neither democratic nor a republic. It was part of the uh, Soviet Union Communist bloc, and, well, enough, enough said about that. On the front you have your two uh, lugs for your strap, and... Uh, 
you have your hot shoe. The hot shoe looks like it has an extra contact point, which would seem to indicate that there is probably, or that there would have been a um, dedicated flash unit for this, for this particular, for this camera. This small window reads the number from your lens uh, aperture dial, and it and it displays it underneath the uh, viewfinder window. On the back here of your eyepiece, it's pretty standard. Um, the viewfinder itself is a little bit different, and I'll draw that out. So the viewfinder, you know, fairly traditional, rectangular, of course. Here's your aperture window down here. Your shutter speed scale runs on the right. And it actually superimposes onto the, um, onto the uh, viewfinder. Now this uses, I guess you could call it a match LED system rather than a match needle. And then it lists all your various shutter speeds down the side. So there will be one, uh, one LED that flashes and then one that stays solidly lit. Oddly enough, the one that is flashing, that's your recommended uh, shutter speed. So you adjust your aperture until only one LED is lit, at which point it stops flashing. This is not drawn to scale. All right, this is a ground glass uh, collar, and in here it's a diagonally split image. But instead of just being of uh, diagonally split, there's, it's almost like a pipe in the middle. I really like this setup. I've seen it before. In fact, it is on this camera that I just showed you earlier. Uh, this uses the same type of, um, of uh, viewfinder. Viewfinder uh, image, I guess I should say. This is a non-replaceable focusing screen. So, you know, that's it. <laughs> You're not swapping it out, but you wouldn't expect it to be swapped out being, you know, an, um, a camera for the amateur market. Let's compare it to the Roloflex SL35E. And you can see that the BMS is uh, shortly, is a bit smaller, not, dra not drastically smaller, but it is a bit smaller. Compare them uh, side to side or back to back, I guess you should say. They're roughly similar. Right? In fact, they're actually sort of similar in shape where there are these rounded rectangles. Some of, you know, some cameras have uh, sort of that hard chopped off corner, but not here. In both cameras, they're sort of rounded off and, uh, you know, they're, they're somewhat similar. Guys, let's weigh these cameras. The Practica comes in at one pound, six ounces. And the Roloflex weighs one pound, 12 ounces, coming in pretty close to two pounds. So that's not a huge weight difference, but you know, if you do carry the camera, it does uh, become noticeable. Particularly if you, per, in particular, if you're carrying uh, one or uh, more lenses and other gear with it. Well, there's not much else to mention about this camera. Like I said, it's uh, fairly small. If you're looking for something that's you know not too large and uh, reasonably uh, uh, reliable, this might fit the bill. This camera was made for just the one year in 1989. Uh, three other cameras were released uh, roughly around the same time or after. Uh, it, uh, there was a BX, BX-10X made from 1989 to 1990. There was a BX-21DX made in 19, also made in 1990. I don't know anything about that model or anything about these other models, in fact. And there was a BX-20S and made in 1992, which would have been um, after the reunification. So I guess they continued um, uh, camera production for a short time and before, the before the company was uh, split up and essentially dissolved. Practica, Practica has a long, long history. It dates back to 1949. So it dates back to five years after the end of World War II and the division of Germany into the eastern uh, western and eastern zones. Practica sat in the eastern zone and uh, produced a, a number of single lens reflex cameras from fairly, uh, you know, all of them were were pretty basic. None of them were like super advanced models. They were very reliable cameras, I think, generally. And uh, they, um, and the lens mount that they used 
I would say most of all was the 42 millimeter uh, screw mount. It was only when they got into this uh, electronic camera that really the, the screw mount no longer served that purpose. So there you have it. So if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. And if you would like me to cover a different camera, please let me know in the comments below. As always, keep on taking photographs.